Thank you, Jesus. Crossing the calm sea with Jesus, the disciples were getting concerned. The wind started violently blowing, but he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that I perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus rose when they called him and said to them, where is your faith? Because I prayed all night, because you held on all your might. God, your child. I mean, I can't hear you. Oh, he knows your, your voice. Lift your hands. It's time to rejoice. Child, your cries have awoken. In case you don't know, we've already started the service. And I want us to enter into loving the Lord. Praise the Lord. A lot of you got your breakthrough this morning. But it's your cries and your prayers that awoke the master. And sometimes you can pray all night and feel like you can't get through. But God has got a specific time that he'll break that yoke in your bondage in your life. But lots of time is when you can let go of it and give it to Jesus. See, when we carry it, it burdens us and it hurts us and it harms us and puts us in bondage. But God wants us to let go. My God, it's time to fly. It's time to soar. It's time to soar for Jesus like an eagle. My God, we need to love him tonight. He's here. Hallelujah. Cries have awoken a master. Oh, he knows your voice. Lift your heads, it's time to rejoice. Child, your cries have awoken a master. Let's do that chorus again. Take a verse.
your life had begun. Seeing no hope in the distance, you're frightened to know where to run. By now your vessel is filling, and you're thinking that you'll surely drown. things for his mighty exploits but he said you gotta also suffer with me if you're gonna reign with me you're gonna have to suffer with me a little bit but he said Paul said it's just for a little moment amen just for a little moment everything that God has promised you and I it will come to pass but there is a season and there is a time that God will move and whatever God has spoken to your life it will happen I don't care how the enemy roars and Satan roars I don't care what he tells you greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world greater is he that's in me that's in this world and God wants to realize don't just talk about it but let's act in that anointing and that spirit that he's put down inside of us don't back up from the devil it's time we make the devil back up a little bit oh my God I love him tonight we are soldiers of God we are the sons of the Most High God. And I was telling you about that scripture this morning. Now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when we see Him, and I'm not talking about physically see Him. I'm talking about having encounters with Him. I'm talking about when I struggle with Him. I'm talking about when the Spirit moves upon me. I'm talking about when God speaks to my life. When He appears to me and I begin to see Him, I can be just like Him. Do you understand? He walked this earth in flesh a man, but He conquered. He conquered. Sing this with her and let's love Him a few more minutes before Bobby and him come. Thank you, Jesus. Your cries will wake the master. He's just waiting on us sometimes to just let go. He knows my voice. He knows my voice. He knows my name. Hallelujah. Thank you. We need to know him personally. Hallelujah again. Yes, we pray all night. Child, your cries have awoken the master. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, actually, God's trying to give me a message on this, and I shouldn't even say this. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of times we preach, a, preach about Peter getting out of the boat in faith. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to stay in the boat. 
and wait out the storm. Y'all not hearing me. Sometimes it's good to stay in that boat. Hallelujah. Because in the end, Peter began to sink because he got his eyes off Jesus. You hear me? When it all ended up, he still, Jesus had to get back in the boat where the disciples were. Do y'all hear me now? Do you hear me now? Sometimes it's safe to stay in that boat. I'm looking at it a whole different way right now. Amen? But in all the absence of it, he got his eyes off Jesus. I'm not preaching, I'm testifying. He got his eyes off Jesus. And he began to think, sure, he stepped out on that water in faith. Hello? The other disciples stood, they might have talked about them, but they stayed in the boat and they kept oaring. They kept struggling with that storm. That wind was a-blowing. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's easy sometimes to try to get out of the storm and get out of the boat. But you know what? God's going to eventually speak peace to that storm. And if you don't conquer that storm, it's going to come back to you again. And you're going to walk around that mountain another time again. Y'all not hearing me? If you don't conquer what's before you, it's going to come against you again. Everybody hear what I'm saying? And that's the reason we need to pray. And we need to say, God, I know you the helm of my boat and the helm of my ship. Because the storm did not stop until Jesus stepped back into that boat. Do you hear what I'm saying? That storm didn't stop until Jesus stepped back in that boat. So we need to realize God cares about us. Just because you got a whole lot of faith don't mean the storm's not coming. Storms help our faith increase. Faith helps. Storms help us begin to depend on the Lord, begin to pray more. Some of you getting what I'm saying. I just want to share that a little bit with you. Because some of you want to run. You can't run and hide. God knows everything about you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, come on back in the boat with me. See, God's not going to get out of the boat or out of my life unless I push him out of my life. And sometimes, Tim, we get so wrapped up in our problem that we try to work it out. You know how that happens sometimes? That we push what God wants out. We don't hear him. We just feel the hurt. We hear the pain. We hear the enemy talking. But it's time to put the enemy behind us. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, even to Peter. And Peter was a disciple of the Lord because Peter wanted God not to have to do what he had to do, but God had a plan. God's got a plan. Somebody said, God's got a plan for my life. Praise the Lord. Let's sing that chorus one more time, Bobby. This... Thank you, Jesus. Eyes awoken, the master. The Lord spoke to me. He's coming to church, and I know God is in this. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I praise you. God is doing a work. Thank you, Jesus. He taught our most son down on the Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing at that altar. Thank you, Jesus. He told us to know about the The disciples were clearly concerned. The wind started violently blowing, and he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus arose when they called him.
storms of your life had begun. See no hope in the distance. You're frightened and nowhere to run. By now your vessel is filling, and you're thinking you surely will drown. You cried out for help from the Savior, and you know, give up. Come on, we can't give up. I pray. Jesus, Lord, as we sing, Lord, those us in the audience and those online, help them to know, Lord, that the warrior is on the inside. We just need to let you stand up and fight for us, Lord. I thank you for moving at that altar and bringing deliverance to her life and setting freedom in her life. I thank you for those tonight, God. Lord, that we get an experience, a real experience with you, Lord. Not something that we've been taught how to do or be and just have a knowledge of. But, God, that we experience a relationship with you. That we know how you care and how you love and how you feel. And no matter what we're going through, Lord, that you're right by our side. Because Paul said it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I thank you for the night the Lord has gathered here to worship you and lift you up, Lord. I pray for their needs, Lord, and I lift up their love, all loved ones. God, that you save them and bring deliverance. I love you tonight, and I thank you for what you're going to do in this service. I thank you for what you're doing right now, God. If only people could know, Lord, what you're doing right now. I thank you, God, for moving this whole body. Lord, from the praise team all the way to the back door. I thank you, Lord, for every person in the sound of my voice. I thank you for total breakthrough that the enemy can't come back in. That will close the door to the enemy's voice in our minds and we'll be set free by the Spirit of the Most High God. I thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One more time. Crossing the calm sea with Jesus. Disciples were getting concerned. The wind started violently blowing. But he was asleep in the stir. Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus arose when they called him and said to them, where is your faith?
kiss you without any warning. The storm of your life had begun. Seeing no hope in the distance. You're frightened to know where to run. By now your vessel is filling. And you're thinking that you're sure. While we're singing this song, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering, since that's a part of worship. I this offering, Lord, the Lord is offering, Lord, Lord, I want you, Lord, to move this, this place tonight, Lord, Lord, in Jesus' name. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm trying to be obedient to the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want you to testify. Well, I had my share of it this morning with Pam. I'm going to get emotional telling it now. Thank you, Jesus. And it was about 13 years ago. So... My mom and my dad had split up when I was real young, and my mom had gotten into a bad situation, and I was living in what many would consider poverty, and I mean, I mean poverty. Man, my favorite meal was a peanut butter and jelly taco, because we didn't have bread. It was poverty. And I don't know, something... I know that my grandma and my dad, they prayed for me to get out of that situation. They prayed for me. I could feel it. I know that they did. And something told me to get out. And I was that kid from that movie, I ran away from home. Because I knew that my dad was going to come find me. And in that moment, I was thinking that my physical father would come find me. But God, my spiritual father came and found me too. And I remember I was getting picked up by my dad. And Lord, I I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to go on from there. But I know I came to this area. Lo and behold, a year after that, I met my wife in science class at a middle school. I met Coach John. I'm going to call him Coach John because he's my life coach through church, and he was my wrestling coach in middle school. And I'm so blessed to join him to what's an incredible family and an incredible church family. And... uh God has blessed me more than I deserve. Yeah. 
<laughs> I thought that was for me, brother. Where's my name? <laughs> but I am so thankful for everyone in this room, and I love every single one of you. I don't know all of your names yet, keywords yet. I'm going to learn them. But I, I do love every single one of y'all. I'm so thankful. Praise God. I did not know that about his life. I just felt like he needed to testify. I think we need to give God a great big hand clap. I'm, I'm going to um, tell a little more than what Alex said. Um, so this morning, um, I'm fixing to tell on us. <laughs> so this morning, um, John and I... Um, Um, had a heated argument before church. And I've been doing a, an online Bible study called The Bait of Satan. And um, he was upset, not at me, uh, by something we had heard this morning. And um, so I said, John, we, we need to hurry. I've got to be at the church. And he was trying to study and get that out of his mind. And so he snapped at me. Well, um, anybody know me? <laughs> well, uh, uh, Pam did not take that very well. And I was like, oh, snap. No, you didn't. And I got up and walked out of the house. And I was leaving the house. I was like, I will not do this with you. I, I like, slammed out of the house. And God said, because uh, I'd been watching the bait of Satan, he said, you took that bait. You took it this morning. And I felt so bad because I knew that he was, God said, he's going to have to get up there and talk to these congregation about love and loving each other, and you're angry with him. He said, shame on you. Well, I wasn't going to let him apologize to me. Because he felt so bad. He he never does that. And he felt so bad. He said, please come in here and talk to me. I said, I want to talk to you. We're good. We're fine. I'm good. I'm good with you. And um, <laughs> so I want you all to know that just because we're the, the pastor and I'm his wife, we still going to have some heated arguments and um, we're not perfect by any means. But anyway, I wouldn't let him apologize to me. And so um, everybody this morning. That is just so God, because I felt so bad that I had um, taken that bait. Um, everybody this morning, Jordan in Sunday school, she goes, Pam, I feel like I need to give you a hug. And Teresa said to me, she was like, Pam, I just want you to know you're the most beautiful pastor's wife I've ever had. And all these things, all these people just on and on and on, all these people were coming up to me and telling me, you know, thankful that we were their pastor and pastor's wife. And so Alex got back to me and he said, I don't even know why I'm coming back here to you, but I feel like I need to tell you this. I am so thankful to be a part of this church. Um, and that had been going on. And I was like, oh. So I came up to the altar. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, I did the wrong thing. I know I did. I took the bait. I stepped in my man. I love him. <laughs> Please forgive me. And uh, so I got, went over and I told John, I was like, you know, we're okay, right? <laughs> but had Alex not done what he did, I don't know that I would have done that. Because I did. I took the hook, line, and sinker. If you get a chance to watch it, he's on YouTube, John DeVar, Bay of Satan. Been watching him. I'm going to re-watch him. But I fell for it this morning. And God knew what he, uh, Satan knew what he was doing because he knew that this service was going to be like this. John would not, had I been ugly with him and continued to have been ugly before that started, we would not have had the breakthrough that we did this morning. So, but it was because Alex <laughs> came, and he was, so, bless his heart, he is so emotional, and he was sobbing, 
And he was like, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I just want you to know that I am so thankful to be a part of this church. And my heart was in an ugly spot. And God still saw fit to say to me, Pam, I love you with everlasting love, no matter that you took the bait. But all of y'all this morning, and it's so funny that that's the way God works, but I mean, all everybody just kept walking up to me, just unprompted. I feel like, Brian, he's like, Pam, are you okay? I just, uh, he grabbed my hand in Sunday school. Jordan, uh, like I said, all these things just kept happening this morning. And I'm, it was the Lord. And, uh, but then Alex, he just, I'm just so thankful to be a part of your family and this church family. And I'm just thankful that God, in my taking the bait, um, he still loves me and saw fit to honor this church this morning for the worship that they ha- we had, um, even though I was ugly with John. <laughs> I told him, uh, we kind of got a good laugh about it because when we got in the car, I was trying to be okay, and I said to him, uh, in a couple of weeks when you talk about this, you can tell them that we argued. <laughs> and he, he kind of he laughed, but... Um, uh, God still loves us, um, even when we take the bait, um, but we can't stay there. So I have the best husband in the world. You know, we laughed, but all of it, she took off her mask. See, God wants us to take not our mask. You can't tell everything. Right. But what God wants to take off our mask. And be real. And say, even when you mess up, he doesn't forgive us. Push us aside. Everybody with me? So take off your mask and be who you are. I heard this, and I am going to let her talk. I was in the restaurant today with some of the church body, and I eavesdropped. I didn't mean to, but this woman was (laughs) testifying. This woman was testifying to her pastor, and she was telling him, she said, I was 17 when I thought, I got saved. She said, I had been taught all my life to go to church, how to sing, how to teach. She said, I even taught. She said, I went to the ritual of all this because I had been taught a certain way to do it, and I could do it, thinking I was saved. But she said, two years later, 19 years old, a preacher came to her church. And then I can only hear bits and pieces of it. But how that she really got saved, she had an experience, a relationship with God. See, I don't want to be something that people has taught me to be, and we shouldn't be. We got to be who we are in Christ. Thank God we're not alike. Thank God we're not alike. We're all different. And I got to listen to her, and I, the pastor, I said, ask him where he's from. He said, the Baptist Church in Randleman, and he said, we're just going to have to shout about this here. And he just had a good spirit, and I got to introduce John. John sort of didn't know I was going to do this. He said, well, who's your pastor? I said, he's sitting right there. And uh, John turned around and sort of grinned a little bit, you know. But I got to listen. People are talking about Jesus. But they're talking about a real experience with Jesus. Not just come to church, pay your tithes, say a little prayer, go home, walk out the door, and John read a scripture because John don't just read a scripture. (laughs) Amen? Amen? So we're blessed here. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. I felt led to ask you, and I love that testimony. God's good, and I thank God for this couple, but I thank God for everybody in here. Clap your hands for Jesus. Alex, the good thing is we're in the South, so you can just honey, sugar, darling, everybody. They'll never know that you don't know their name.
Tell. Um, Judy, this morning I uh, read the scripture in Romans that talks about there's therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who follow after the Spirit. But that does not mean that sometimes we don't take the bait. That does not mean that sometimes we don't mess up. And I took the bait this week, and I messed up this week. And sometimes God convicts us, but He doesn't condemn us. And so His love covers the afflictions and his glory covers the afflictions thank God for that and if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking thank God and thank God that his mercies are new every morning and thank God that we are imperfect people and he still allows us to worship him even though he is perfect and thank God every morning he says that's my child and he knows that we're imperfect and thank God he grows us from glory to glory to glory to glory to get us to what we're supposed to be I know I'm not perfect but thank God he doesn't give up on me thank God he doesn't give up on you thank God he doesn't give up on us thank God he's still growing us thank you We had something else planned, but God, God's plan came to pass. So you may be seated um, in the presence of the Lord as Pastor John comes to bring the word. Praise the Lord, church. Ain't God good? I mean, I appreciate his presence. 
Praise the Lord. Mm. In his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is our answers. Oh, Lord, in his presence we find everything we need. Praise the Lord. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, he's an on time God. He is an on time God. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all didn't get happy about that like I thought you would. I said he's an on time God. That means he don't delay. You might think it's a delay, but it ain't a delay to him. When he does it, he does it in his time. And when it's his time, it's perfect time. How many know it's perfect time when God moves in his way? Praise the Lord. Mm. My Lord. I believe tonight everybody's staying in, so we get the whole crowd today. Praise the Lord. If, mm, I'm ready to preach. Are you ready to receive? Praise the Lord. Have, if you have your Bibles, go with you to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> like I, I, I mentioned earlier today, this morning, I actually mentioned that... Uh, uh, God had spoke to me and said that it was going to be one of those kind of services, one of those kind of days. And then this morning, the way he broke loose and the way he moved in this place, and I told you then, I don't know what's coming tonight. But the Lord has led me to, uh, to go with the message that, that we were originally going to do this morning. Um, <clears throat> and I just got to say that um, God is, <laughs> uh, God, God's funny. <laughs> How many know God got a sense of humor? Yes. I mean, anybody but me ever say, ever made the statement, Jesus, you got jokes. I mean, um, this past week, uh, it started out, it was an amazing week. Had a great service Sunday morning. We took off, went to uh, went to the Outer Banks, went to Manio, and it was a great trip. Watched and listened. Well, actually, I listened, watched some of it when Pam wasn't watching me because uh, she had it on her phone, so I was watching some of it, but listening to mo most of the service till we ran into a spot without signal. It was an amazing service that was here last week. Uh, had a great time at the beach, really had a, I mean, really enjoyed ourselves, a nice relaxing time, uh, really didn't do anything, we just basically drove around and looked and had a great time. Then we came home. <laughs> yeah, then we came home. Uh, so, and then from Thursday through Saturday evening, it seemed like, I don't, y'all had to have had a great week. Everybody in this place had to have had an amazing week because there's no way hell could have been after anybody else but me. Anybody ever had one of them weeks? Praise the Lord. And, and, then, and then I got up this morning, and, and I hope she ain't watching, but if she is, I mean, y'all never hear me say that again. But I got, but I saw, my phone went off, and I looked, and I was like, man, I just, I can't right now. I just can't. So I just sort of said, okay, I'll just, I'll just get back with them later. Well, then I got, we got a call on the other line, and I got some more news that was just like the icing on the cake for the week. And I was like, oh, my Lord Jesus, what next? And then Pam told you our story. So it was like, wow, what kind of week is this? And here I am, God's man of faith and power, going to have to stand up in front of people and talk about the love of God. Then God broke loose this morning. That's amazing. And then the more and more I thought about the message that God gave, the more I said, Jesus, you got jokes. Praise the Lord. Jesus, you got jokes. Because, uh, well, well, let's just read. 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, <laughs> threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, <laughs> what do you have in the house? <laughs> Mm, nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. 
When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. My Lord, let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we're thankful for your anointing and your presence, God. Lord, we just pray, God, that your word would fall on good ground tonight, that it would help mold us and make us into everything that you want us to become. And, Lord, we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. For it's in the name of Jesus that we ask it all. And the church says... <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So tonight, church, we're going to continue in our series called Come On In The House. This is going to be the fifth installment. I believe it's been impactful, and I believe it's needed and it's timely. Now, in our text for today, we're going to see some very powerful principles that we can apply to our lives. I've been saying this a lot during this series, and I believe it's powerful. But the fact of the matter is, in order for us to understand the text, then we got to get some context for the place we're reading. And so when we look at the text, when we talk about a lot, what we can see is that he's just solved the problem for three kings. Okay, he's helped the lady who's struggling, and then he's helped the lady who's wealthy. And that gets me excited already, church. I told you I feel like preaching. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Because now what we can take from this is the fact that we should not just do ministry centered around one particular group. Because the fact of the matter is, church, church is not supposed to be this or that. Church is supposed to be this and that. In other words, we don't have to be limited by anything but the God and what the gospel says because when church is done right oh lord somebody better come get me because I'm starting to preach already when church is done right it ain't this or that it's this and that in other words it ain't about me being judgmental it ain't about me being condemning towards certain non-eternal and condemning things that are not eternal stuff it ain't about me trying to look down my nose at somebody else that's looking, trying to look all holy and pure by putting down some Somebody else. You see, church ain't a museum where we display our goodness and our righteousness. It ain't a place where we put on display how good we think we is. It ain't a place where we say, hey, look at me. It ain't meant to have everybody take a look at how good you is. It's about coming together and realizing that God is not done with me yet. My Lord, my stuff ain't no different than your stuff, church. My things ain't no different than your things. And as long as neither one of us is perfect, then guess what? Neither one of us has any right. Y'all got to excuse me because I get a little tore up about this. Nobody has any right to look down their noses at anybody because my Bible teaches me that there is none righteous, no, not one. My Lord, church, what that tells me is that sister better than you and brother holier than thou needs to get up on that altar just as much as I need to be up on that altar. It means we all got some stuff that we all need help with. All we like sheep have gone astray. That means everybody. That means me and that means you. Everybody has stuff that needs work. It means we all have served the same God. We're all in process and guess what? We all need the same Jesus. And I say it all the time, but he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Hmm. <laughs> I got to stop right there and give it a pause and I got to give my God some praise for being so patient with me. I don't know about you, but he's been mighty patient with me when other people may have given up, when others threw in the towel and gave up on John, when everybody else said he ain't worth it. My Jesus stood up and he said, look at here, I died for that boy. I died for him. I love him that much that I died for him. So you can look at me funny if you want to. You can talk about me if you want to. You can and laugh at me but I will still praise my God because he is worthy to be praised some people may turn their nose up but he don't some people might look down on me but he don't some people may talk about me but he don't because he said I love him enough that I'll die for him hmm. and his church should be this and that we ain't here to show our goodness we're here to thank him for his Mm. This ain't a museum for saints. It's a hospital for the sick and the suffering. If you're looking for a place to worship the Lord in spirit and truth that's free from judgment and condemnation, guess what? You're in the right place. Because ministry was never meant to be a catered event. 
<laughs> it was meant for whosoever will. Whosoever will come and drink. Whosoever will come and eat. Whosoever will come and get your fill. This is a whosoever gospel, and I'm a whosoever preacher. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, my Lord, I'm a whosoever. And Elisha's helping everybody. <laughs> He's helping everybody. He's helping kings. He's helping poor folks. He's helping rich folk. And then we step into this story and we see this woman who's in a very bad place. This woman's in despair. She's depressed. She's hurting. She's going through what's probably the hardest time of her life. Her husband's dead. He done left her with so much debt she can't pay it. Now imagine this. She just found out her husband's dead. So she already having a bad day. And before she can even begin the grieving process, here come the bills. Let me modernize this for you. She starts cleaning out stuff and she finds all these bills that ain't been paid. And there's tons of debt. And just when she thinks it can't get any worse, there comes a knock on the door. And I can just picture the scene. She opens the door, and there stands the bill collector. And the bill collector says, I'm here to take your kids. So she got some drama going on. <clears throat> now, I know some of us have been there. And I know there may even be some folks in here that's there right now. And I know, Lord, I know, there's some folks I'd like to put on a show, and they like to act like they ain't got no problems. But it's just us. We can talk, can't we? You see, so what do you do when your problems got problems? <laughs> I told y'all Jesus got jokes. <laughs> now, I personally wish that life gave us a mulligan for bad days. Anybody know what a mulligan is? Some of you do because I've seen you use them. <laughs> you see... It's what you use when you're on the golf course and the shot you just hit got a little wet <laughs> or it got a little sandy or it got so deep in the woods you can't find your ball with a sonar. <laughs> in other words, a mulligan is a do-over. <laughs> and I just wish that life would give us a mulligan on certain days. <laughs> Lord, just give me this one to do all over again because this ain't looking too good of a day Lord let me do it again does anybody know what I'm talking about anybody ever had one of them days where you just wish you could do over where my real church where the real crowd are going to say hey pastor I know there's days I'm the bird and I'm soaring above everything and everybody but then there's other days I ain't the bird I'm the statue some of you got that <laughs> you ever had one of them days you wish you could just do over but the fact is, as much as we wish we did, it did, life don't work that way. Because a lot of times, some of us can testify that it feels like if it ain't for one thing, it's another. I can't win for losing. And this lady is having one of those kind days. That kind you just as soon could do over. So she got problems on top of problems. And some of us have been there, and some of us might even be there right now. If it ain't one thing, it's another. I need a break. First I was sick. Then I got bills. Then my kids start tripping on me. Anybody ever seen that one? My husband acting crazy. Wife done went off the deep end. Then my family starts going absolutely crazy. And don't even get me started about my job. My Lord, we could be here for days. What do I do when it feels like I'm taking hit after hit? Now she in debt. And the creditors have come to take her kids. What if you didn't pay Duke Energy and instead of calling you and threatening to turn it off, they showed up at your kid's school to take them. They went to your kid's school and said, oh, come on, boo-boo. You coming with me. <laughs> Since mama didn't pay the bill, you got to go with us. You see, and the reason why this story is so important is because, catch this church, please, please catch this. It shows us that you can love God, love your family, love your church, and still have problems. 
My Lord, I come to talk to the real crowd today. I come to talk to some folks who's honest enough to say, Hey, Pastor, I love God. I love my family. And New Day is my church, and it's awesome. But I still got some problems. I still got some stuff. See, in a lot of places, the problem is the gospel is presented as a problem-free, no issues kind of message. And some places program people into believing that if everything is not just so and everything ain't coming up daisies and you ain't tiptoeing through the tulips of a perfect life, then evidently you ain't doing something right. We get people to the altar. We say, just repeat this prayer after me. Then we stand them up and we say, oh, you victorious now. All your problems is over. Well, I'm going to tell you something, honey. If that's the way it is, and I definitely ain't doing something right. We're the real church today. Who's going to be real with me today? See, I came to talk to a group of folks, folks today who a lot of times and in a lot of places feels ignored because the gospel has been presented in a way that it's all about favor and prosperity. Once you get saved, all your problems is over. But I need to talk to some people tonight who find themselves in an awkward place because you've been fed a lie that if you ain't living life without issues or living life without problems, then there's a problem. See, the fact is, guess what, church? Your favor ain't determined by how much money you got. <laughs> it ain't measured by how few problems you got. Favor, a lot of times, is not shown by what you've not been through, but what you have. <laughs> Mary was called blessed and highly favored. And a lot of times we look at that and we shout and we run the aisles and we jump the pews and we dance all over the place. But we got to break it down. We got to look at it because Mary was blessed and highly favored. But because she was blessed and highly favored, she was about to enter into the hardest season of her life. She was about to get picked on and treated like something that she wasn't. She was about to get talked about. Matter of fact, she was the one who birthed Jesus and she was the one that went with him all the way. She watched her son die on a cross not for anything he did but for everything we did she was blessed and highly favored but my lord look at what she went through to be there hmm. favor ain't determined by how you never go through anything as a matter of fact I would argue that if the enemy is not doing everything he can do to get you discouraged depressed and disconnected then guess what you ain't doing something right uh, he ain't gonna fight who he already got See, favor is not determined by you being knocked, not being knocked down. No, favor is determined by the fact that, yes, I have been knocked down a time or two in my life. But guess what? I still got back up. And I'm here to tell somebody today, it's time that you get back up. It's time to get up. Because the fact is, there's some people who I believe just listening to me right now or watching me right now who were saved and struggling. And we never talk about that. We never talk about saved and struggling. And I don't know who this is for, but I need you to know that it's possible to love God, serve in church, be Holy Ghost filled, and still be going through some stuff. And what I want all of us to do is make up our minds that even if I'm going to go through some things, there's four areas that I got to make sure I'm staying on top of. <laughs> I will be saved. I will give, I will store, and I will have a plan. I'll be saved, I'll give, I'll store, and I'll have a plan. Saved. God's got all of me. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 says, I will worship the Lord with your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Everything I am is his. I, we sing the song, I give myself away. I don't give part of me. I don't give a little piece of me. I give all of me away. He got me from head to toe and every point in between. And I give myself away. I'm talking about I give it all. Not part, not some, but all of me. I have a buddy of mine, we all know him, he likes to put it something like this. A part-time Christian can't defeat a full-time devil. That's right. That's true. I will be saved. I will give. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. 
give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give in your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with it shall be measured to you again. Now before some of y'all who don't know me very well who's watching online, who don't know me, maybe there's some in here, I don't know, who want to start calling me names and talk about how I preach about money. Let me just share a little secret with you. I don't think this verse is talking about just money. My Lord, now don't get me wrong. I believe God fully expects us to do our part in giving our resources. But I've also seen a lot of misguided people who feel like all they need to give God's a check. Came right out there, didn't it? Can't get that one back. You see, I believe God requires more from us than our financial obedience. See, the Bible teaches me that faith without works is dead. So when I say that I will give, I'm saying he'll get more from me than just a check. He's going to get my commitment. He's going to get my dedication. He's going to get my faithfulness. He's going to get all of me because I will give. See, I've lived long enough to know that everything don't come back the way I sowed it. <laughs> now, this ain't no shade at anybody, but I know a lot of people in a lot of places that tried to convince us that the verse we read earlier was talking about money. Give and it shall be given you. And just about every revival and every preacher that comes around has used that verse when they take up an offering. Well, we're losing a certain crowd tonight, ain't we? Mm. But I've looked and I've read enough to know that that verse never mentions money. I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> and I know that everything doesn't come back in the way that I sow it. You see, there was times when I thought that if I sowed money, then money would come back. But it didn't come back. Peace came back. There was times I thought if I sowed time, then other things would come back, but joy came back. See, I need to tell you something I hope we can get. I'm done trying to label what's coming back when I sow whatever it is I sow. I'm just going to be grateful for whatever it is that God sends. Because church, get this. I believe that whatever he sends... It's going to meet every need I got. Because it says, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is he knows what I need before I know what I need. He knows what I need before I ask. He knows me better than I know me. And therefore, I need to trust that whatever it is that he sends is going to be exactly what I need. Peace is coming back. Joy is coming back. Health is coming back. Oh, come on now. Let's have a little church tonight. My family is coming back. My loved ones is coming back. My mind is coming back. Good measure. Press down and running over is coming back. Hmm. Hmm. I will store. Matthew chapter 6 verse 20. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, there's a lot of people who are more worried about what they can store in earthly places than heavenly places. Now, don't get me wrong, church. There ain't nothing wrong with storing things in earthly places. I believe you should prepare for your future by storing things. And not to do that is very unwise. But when the main concern is what I can put in the bank rather than what I can store in a heavenly bank, then I got problems. In other words, Mark 8, 36 says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? I will store. Finally, I'll plan. Now here's the part where we can tie in all the hell that we've been going through. This is where I can say I'm going to come out from this better than I came in. <laughs> My Lord, I think you missed it. See, this is the part where I can look and I can say, oh yeah, there's a storm, but I'm coming out this storm better than I was when I first started in this storm because God's got a plan and whatever his plan is, I might not see it. I might not understand it. Quite frankly, there's times I might not even like it, but I do know that whatever his plan is, it's going to work out for my good. So whatever it is that I'm going 
going through is going to make me a better me. Yes, I'm going through a storm. Yes, I'm dealing with this. But guess what? The sun's coming up in the morning and every tear shall be gone from my eyes. I will come out stronger, better, and more determined than ever before. Amen. The Bible tells me we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. You won't get a testimony without a test any day of the week. You don't get that, church. For you to have a testimony, you got to have a test. And God's going to use this trial and he's going to use this hard time to help me to become what he's molding me into. And when I come out of this, I'll have a testimony that not only helps me to overcome, it's going to help somebody else to overcome too. That testimony you heard earlier, yes, that helped that man overcome, but guess what? That's something going to help somebody else overcome too. What the enemy meant for evil, the Lord turned it around for my good. I'll take this adversity. I'll take this fight. I'll take this battle, and I will see a victory. I'm confident, Psalms 27 and 13 tells me, I'm confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will plan. Mm. But this lady's got some issues. Her husband's died. Her bills is behind. And now the creditors come to take her children. Can I just say something right here? Hell doesn't cover you up. It uncovers who you are. Thank you, Lord. Problems don't conceal you. They reveal you. Because when God wants to show you what's in you, he don't give you everything you ask for. See, a lot of times when God's showing you to you, you begin to face a problem. I know it ain't popular, but it's still good preaching. <laughs> Amen, Brother John. You keep preaching. That's good stuff. Why does he do this? Because storms do not produce problems. They expose problems. Think about it like this. A storm don't cause a leaky boat. A storm exposes a leaky boat. When God wants you to see what's in you, he'll allow something on you. Why? Because certain people can fake anything they got. <laughs> Lord help us. <laughs> I've seen people speak in tongues in the sanctuary, catch them in the parking lot 30 minutes, and they speaking in a tongue, all right? <laughs> Why? Because problems do not conceal people, they reveal people. And this lady finds herself in a situation that would tear down a lot of people. But we can see what's in her in the first verse. Because the Bible tells in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1, it said that she cried out. My Lord, that'll preach right there. Because there's times in this journey called life when you go through something that takes everything out of you. You see, life can sometimes leave you looking for hope, joy, and peace. No matter how strong you think you are, sometimes you'll get hit with something you cannot handle. But when moments like this happen, when you feel like you're sinking, when life gets overwhelming, I don't know who I'm talking to who feels overwhelmed, who feels like it's hard to move forward, but there's one thing that you can do. You can cry out. There's one thing I can do. I can still cry. Lord, save me. And he'll lift you up every time. See, she got problems. She can't do anything about her husband dying. She can't do anything about the bills because she ain't got any money. She can't do anything about these creditors knocking on her door to take her kids. But there's one thing she can control. She can control her praise because she can still cry out, who am I preaching to tonight? I'm done with trying to fix my situation. I'm through trying to figure it out. I don't know about you, but I just want to take a few seconds and cry out. God, if I ever needed you, I need you now. And if you won't cry out for you, I'm just crazy enough to cry out for you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, fix our situations. We can't do it on our own. We need you, Lord. We can't fix this by ourselves. 
ourselves. We need you to heal our bodies. We need you to heal our minds. We need you to heal our families. Lord, heal our land. I'm crying out. And you said, if I cry out to you, if I humble myself, if I seek your face and turn from my wicked ways, you'll hear from heaven and you will hear my, heal my land. I'm crying out, Lord. I might not be able to do nothing else, but I can still cry out to him. And he will hear my cry. Huh. Fix our brokenness. Fix our hearts. Fix our thoughts. You are still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. If you can't do it, it can't be done. So tonight, Father, we cry out to you and we stretch forth our hands. Mm. I need somebody to help me and realize that if I can't do it, if it's beyond my control, if there's nothing else I can do, I can still praise him. Because when I've done all I can, he will do all he can. My Lord, that's strong right there. Some of you missed it. Some of you didn't get all that. Let me just repeat that again. If I can, when I've done all I can, then he'll do all he can. My Lord, he will fix it. We just need to cry out. Oh, my Lord, I need to show you something. I need to show you something. Psalms 116 and verse 1. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. My Lord, that encourages me, church. Why? Because there's been times whenever you felt like and I felt like you've been praying and you ain't getting through. But I need you to catch this. Just because you can't hear God does not mean that he ain't heard you. My Lord, I hope you caught that. He's heard your cries. He's heard your prayers. He's seen your tears. And he's working on your answer. And he may not come when you want him but he'll still be there y'all know where I'm going he'll be there right on time oh, he is an on time God huh I gotta tell somebody there in the sound of my voice don't let the enemy lie to you and say you can't handle what you're going through don't listen to that lie God says he equips who he calls and he's brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this he'll not allow on you more than you can bear and not only will you survive this thing you're going through you will grow this ain't gonna create a gravestone it's gonna create a stepping stone cause you are an overcomer you are the head not the tail you the apple of his eye you the victor not not the victim. You are stronger and you are well able to defeat this giant because you ain't fighting in your strength. You fighting in his. Hmm, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Guess what? You already had everything in you that you needed before you was born. Now God just trying to activate it and bring it out of you. So don't say you ain't enough. Don't say you ain't good enough. Don't say you can't do this and you can't do that. Everything you ever needed has always been in you. We got to let God activate it and pull it out of you. Somebody needs to let God pull it out. Pull the best me out of me, Lord. Make me what you want me to be. Make me what you created me to be. Make me a better me. Mm. My Lord. So the widow woman cries out. And then Elisha in 2 Kings 4, 2, he says, what can I do to help? And if you think about it, if you read it, now maybe I'm just weird, but my wife's on a delay on that camera. She'd have been shouting. <laughs> Maybe I'm just weird, but when I read that, it almost makes me think that Elisha's getting ready to pull out the checkbook. I mean, watch this. Let's don't get too deep right here with this now. Let's, let's catch what we got here. She comes to him and she says, my husband is dead. My bills is past due, and the creditors are trying to take my kids. And he says, what can I do to help? So the first thing that a lot of us is thinking he's going to do is whip out the checkbook and write our check. But then he answers his question with a question. He says, what can I do to help? <laughs> now tell me what you got in the house. Mm. I know what you lost, but tell me what you got left. <laughs> I know what you lost, but tell me what's left. So watch this. <laughs> I can meet the need if you give me something to work with. 
<laughs> now let me help somebody. <laughs> Watch what she, she says in that same verse. It's 18 for 2. I have nothing at all except. Let me help somebody here. I hope you received this. This is powerful. Because see, there's times when we can forget exactly what it is that we have that we take for granted. Don't ever forget where you came from and where God's brought you from. Because right now is a gift from God and should be appreciated. You might not have everything you want, but you do have everything you need. Your home might not be a mansion, but it's a gift from God. Your wife might get on your nerves sometimes, but she's a gift from God. Your husband may act like, well, a husband, but he's still a gift from God. Your kids might be acting like a hot mess right now, but they still a gift from God. Your ministry might not be where you think it ought to be, but it's still a gift from God. Your church might not be perfect but guess what it's still a gift from God never forget what you've been given never forget where he's brought you from 1 Thessalonians 5 18 says giving thanks always <laughs> see sometimes we get so overwhelmed by our perceived lack that we minimize our supply Sometimes we get so overcome by what we think we don't have or by what we think we're missing that we minimize what we have. When the need seems so much bigger than the supply, you can begin to see what you have as nothing. Let me make that closer to home, and it might just be me that's ever been here. <laughs> but when the bill's a thousand and all you guys a hundred, <laughs> let me hold something again. <laughs> We can respond not based on who the supplier is. We can respond based on our lack. So when the bill's a thousand and all you got's a hundred and you're looking at what you got, most of us have said the same thing. Nothing. Because we think we ain't got enough. When I serve a God who can take nothing and turn it into something. I'm about to preach right here. I hope y'all with me here. He takes nothing and he turns it into something. We only got two fish and five loaves. My Lord, give it to him and watch him flip it. Because God flips whatever you give him. God will turn it around. He'll turn around whatever you give him. Give him your situation. Give him your circumstance. Give him your lost loved one. If you have a little faith you can move mountains because if you give it to God he will turn it around yeah. 2nd Peter 5 7 1st Peter 5 7 cast all your cares on him give all I like how this translation puts it give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you he didn't say give him some of them he didn't say give him part of them he said give them all to God because he cares for you he don't care about you partially he don't care about you just some of what you got going on you the apple of his eye church give all your cares to him for he cares for you and if he cares for you he's working all things out for my good give it to God and he will turn it around. Has anybody in here ever had a situation he turned around for you? He's still the God of the turnaround. And there's a lot of people right now who's frustrated and agitated because you keep saying, I only got a little bit. You keep saying, I ain't this and I ain't that. And God's saying, that's good because that's all I need. Oh, you missed it. Oh, you missed it. Some of us have said before, I ain't got enough. All I got is this and all I got is that. And God's saying, hey, that's a good thing. That's what I gave you because that's all I needed from you right there. You got everything you need because I know what I gave you. I don't know who I'm preaching to in here today, but don't let your light convince you that you and God are in the same situation. Ha, huh, my Lord, I might not have enough, but guess what? My God's got plenty. I might not be feeling good, but God's doing just fine. I might be a little short, but God's got more than enough. He, Psalms 50 and 10, said he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Guess what? He owns it all, and he's telling us today, if we give it to him, he'll turn it around. So I'm saying, Lord, flip my finances, flip my family, flip my health, flip my job. Flip it, Lord, turn it around. Elisha says, what you got in the house? 
My Lord, this is powerful. I hope we get this. <laughs> Since the devil can't take your oil, he'll try to get you to minimize your oil. Mm, I hope we caught that. Since the devil can't take your oil, he'll try to get you to minimize your oil. He can't take it, he'll try to get you to minimize it. The enemy can't take the anointing God's place in your life. He didn't give it, he didn't take it away. But he can convince you that the oil you got ain't enough. He can try to make you feel less than. He can try to make you think you ain't good enough. But today, I bind the spirit of comparison. I bind the spirit of competition. I ain't competing against other people and other ministries. I ain't comparing my oil all to somebody else's all. What God has for me, it is for me. What God's got for everybody else, it's for everybody else. It's for them. But I'm thankful for what he gave me and what he gave me is enough to do what he's called me to do. He can take it and he can use it for his glory and for his purpose. If I'll give it to him, I got all. The reason why I didn't lose my mind, I got a little oil left. The reason why I hadn't give up, because I had a little oil left. The reason why I've been able to keep praying and keep believing, because I had a little oil left. I got to tell somebody today who feels like you just barely holding on and you've been wanting to throw in the towel, just keep holding on, honey, because God's about to take your oil and he's about to use your oil. And just when you don't think you've got enough, God said, hey, that's all I need. Just give it to me. Hmm. What you got in the house? All I got is a little oil. Because the enemy knows. He can't take it, but he can get you to devalue it. And the reason why some of us sometimes struggle with feeling less than or feeling not good enough in certain areas is because the enemy's got us to devalue the oil we got. Huh. Boy, that's strong, ain't it? Oh, that's strong, but that's true. Less than in my family, devalued. Less than in my ministry, devalued. Less than on my job, devalued. Less than in my, less than in my walk with God, devalued. See, the reason why some of us feel less than or accept less than because the enemy's convinced us that our oil is not enough. But God is saying, give it to me. All I need is all of you. That's all you got to do, just give it to him. So she says, I ain't got nothing in my house but that's one little jar of oil. <laughs> I got to show you something. <laughs> my Lord, I'm trying to, oh, I'm, I'm trying, but. Well, you most of y'all know what that means anyway. <laughs> I got a whole lot of messages left and not much time. So <laughs> hope it hits you like it did me. Second Kings chapter 4 and verse 3. Because this is where I think we struggle with our mentalities and the way we think sometimes. Because Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can find from your friends and neighbors. Hmm. You see, most of us would be saying, I don't need jars, I need oil. Did you catch that? Because when he said at the end, when we read, he tells her to go sell. He don't say go sell the jar. He said go sell the oil. So a lot of us are saying, Lord, give me the oil. <laughs> oh, my Lord, I got to teach something right here. Y'all ready for this? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void and without form. And darkness filled the covered the face of the deep, right? Moved on the face of the deep. The earth was void and without form. See, before God can fill it, he got to form it. <laughs> See, that's why you got to be saved before you can be Holy Ghost filled. Because God's got to form you before he can fill you. Because, see, here's the thing. You don't really need to get oil. What you need to get is something to hold it in. <laughs> My Lord, I'm fitting to run all over the church. I'm about to have church because maybe what we need to pray is for us to be able to handle what God's about to do in our lives. My Lord, God's got everything we need, church, but sometimes we praying for an answer we ain't ready to handle. Lord, I want you to expand my ministry. How you doing with the one you got now? Lord, I need this financial blessing. How you doing with what he already gave you? Lord, I want to be this or I want to be that. How you doing with what he's already given you? This ain't popular, but there's times we ask him for things we ain't prepared for. And I know some would say they don't have a ministry. They don't have this. They don't have that. They don't have what they're asking for. But that's just like saying, I ain't got nothing. <laughs> I ain't got nothing but... 
Because when we really take a good hard look, then we'll see God's been good to us in ways that we've not even recognized. Now, church, I know this might not build crowds. It might not tickle ears, but it's the truth anyway. Because for too long, the church in general has preached the message of bless me, bless me, bless me without taking any kind of responsibility. Name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. But I just believe in this day and in this hour, God is raising up a mature, grown-up remnant who knows that, yes, God will bless you, but he expects you to do your part too. Jesus told the man by the Bethesda pool, Rise, you get up. Take up your bed. You take it up and walk. You walk. He told the man with the withered hand, Stretch forth your hand. You stretch it out. The woman with the issue of blood had to press through the crowd. See, church, my concern is that the church world today is raising up a new generation of people who only want to sit back and receive and not do any kind of rising, stretching, or pressing. But can I tell you, church, I believe that God not only asks, he requires us to do what we can too. God ain't some kind of cosmic Santa Claus. No, it's not all about our effort, but he does ask us to use what he's already given us. John 9, 4 says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. Mm, my Lord, we got to do something. I need force to see something. 2 Kings 4, 3, Elisha said to go bar as many empty jars as you can. Go ask everybody who connected to you to borrow what you need and make sure you get enough because what I'm about to do in your life and what I'm about to do for you is greater. Church, this next season we enter in is about to be the greatest season we ever beat in. My Lord, how do you know? Because with great adversity comes great victory. All this stuff we've been going through is just setting up what I believe the biggest victory and the greatest victory we've ever experienced. That's why I believe we're about to see an explosion we keep talking about. Miracles is about to happen. I believe loved ones are about to come in that's why I believe that we're about to step into the greatest revival in history God did not bring us this far to drop us where we are he didn't bring you here for you to die he brought you here to live today we serve the devil notice because he thought we was going to lose faith and we was going to give up and give in but the devil is a liar my God is still able to meet every need he's still able to save he's still able to deliver Liver. He's still able to heal. He's still able. My God is still in control for greater, greater joy, greater peace, greater opportunity, greater anointing, greater doors. Borrow as many as you can. In other words, I'm going to channel my inner old school T.D. Jakes. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. God's about to move in the miraculous. And then what happens in verse 4 messes me up. We're just now getting to the heart of the message. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. I got plenty of message, not much time. The heart of the day, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 4, he says to shut the door. I came to tell somebody today the problem is not that God's not been blessing, it's You've been leaving the door open. <laughs> and it's so important. Why would we need to shut the door? Verse 1 told us the creditors come. Then in verse 4 he said, do me a favor, shut the door. Why? Because the creditor's there. He didn't say the creditor was coming. He said the creditor has come. Which means she's in the house and the creditor's right outside the door. <laughs> so you leave the door open for him to come in. So she runs to Elisha and she tells him. And he says, go borrow as many jars as you can. Now keep in mind, oh, I got I to gotta preach this part too. <laughs> go borrow as many jars as you can. Keep in mind, he never speaks to the sons, but he speaks to the mothers. Which is why your house has got to be in order. Because if mama got a word, but the family goes the other way, they're going to block the whole blessing. If daddy got a word, but daddy and mama keep arguing about what they're supposed to be and who's this and who's that, then they're going to mess up the whole blessing God's got for the whole family. You see? <laughs> so the creditor's there and he's saying, you need to pay these bills, we're going to take your kids. So he goes to Elisha and she says, 
And Elisha, he says, what do you got in the house? She says, I don't have anything. She answers out of her brokenness. Because when you look at it, the need's more than the supply. You take a look at what you got is nothing. He says, when you get home, close the door because they're going to be looking. And if you let them see what God's about to do, then they're not going to take your oil. They're going to take your vessels. Right. Oh, Lord, did you catch that? He said, pour the oil from your flask into the jars. Go get vessels from other folks and take the little bit you underestimated. <laughs> take that little bit you ignored. Take that little bit you thought wasn't enough. <laughs> In other words, please catch this. And this is probably one of the most powerful statements of the night. What you needed, you already had. <laughs> what you needed, you already had. You just didn't see it right. My Lord! What you needed, you already had. You just didn't see it right. But since you're now walking in obedience, it can now be activated. Lord, I hope you got that. A lot of times we asking God for this and we asking God for that. And, and what God's saying is your answer's already there. I need you to walk in obedience so I can activate what I already gave you. I'm trying to close. I'm, I really am. So the text tells in verses uh, 5 and 6 that she went in and shut the door. But now we got to go back a verse before I close because i got to show you something. In 2 Kings 4 and 4, she got a prophetic word. She got the prophetic word. And she's obedient to the prophetic word. And a lot, a lot of times we wonder why God hadn't done it yet. And a lot of times it's because of our disobedience. <laughs> I'm going to keep praying in the middle of my storm, church. I'm going to keep worshiping in the middle of my trial. I'm going to keep trusting God in spite of my circumstance. I'm going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. Even when all hell is coming against me, I'm going to keep serving God despite my situation because my situation, no matter how it looks, what it feels like or what it seems, does not change the promise of God. The problem does not change the promise. My Lord, we got to get a hold of that. If said God said he was going to keep you six months ago, then what you going through doesn't change now. What he promised you then is still true today if you'll just walk in obedience. Jesus told you to go to the other side. And now that you're in the middle of the lake, this storm has come up. But guess what? This storm does not change the word that he gave you. Circumstances do not change his word, but his word can surely change your circumstance. My Lord church, his word will not return unto him void. It will accomplish what has been sent forth to do. I came to give you an announcement what God is about to do in your life and in the lives of those connected to you is so much greater. You don't have time for fear. You don't have time for doubt. You don't have time for negativity. You don't have time for distraction. I came to tell somebody tonight to close the door. Close the door on every hater. Close the door on every negative person. Close the door on doubt. Close the door on discouragement. Close the door on your past. Close the door on your pain. Close the door on that betrayal. Close the door on those who talked about you. Close the doors on those who treated you like that. Too many times we get our answer, but we leave the door open for all these other things to step right on back in there. But today, it's time to tell your past, I am free. And God's about to do something greater if we'll just close the door. My Lord, come on, musicians. As they're coming to play, can we just stand? Just stand and begin to praise Him. Because I'm about to give you four words. It's going to change your life if you'll just receive it. Thank you. I got four words that will change your life if you'll just receive it. It won't run out. It won't run out. 2 Kings 4, 7. When she told the man of God what happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts. 
and you and your sons can live on what's left over. God's saying he's given you everything you need in this season. Maybe not everything you want, but he's given you everything you need. Psalms 37, 25, so I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. I don't know who's wrestling in your mind right now. But I bind everything and anything that would hinder your activation. I need anybody in this place who's dealing with some stuff. This is different for a Sunday night, but I want every head bowed and every eye closed. You dealing with some things that seem overwhelming to you. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. I need you to slip your hand up and say, pray for me. Thank God for these hands going up all over this building. <laughs> we going to get somewhere today. Now I need to pray for you. You dealing with some things, past hurts, past pain, that's caused you to be in places you don't want to be in. I struggle with trust. I struggle with opening up. I struggle with church in general. Is that you? Slip your hand up. You here today, you going through some stuff you never thought you'd be going through. It might be relationships. It might be in your mind. It might be in your body. Whatever it is, you're dealing with some stuff you never thought in, in a minute you'd be dealing with this. Slip your hand up. Thank God. Thank God these hands going up. Today's your day. Today you can be set free. Today is the day. But there's one thing we got to do. We got to close the door. We got to close the door on the past. We got to close the door on unbelief. We got to close the door on doubt. Close the door on discouragement. We got to close the door on distraction. Today we close the door. lifted your hand for any reason whatsoever I want you up at this altar I want you up at this altar don't wait on somebody else to be the first I need you up at this altar I need you up at this altar we're going to pray with everybody we're going to pray with everybody but I need you up at this altar everybody that's up around this altar God's going to do some amazing stuff in this place today God's going to do some amazing stuff in this place today. If you're up here, I need you praising. I need you worshiping. I need you in His presence. I need you in His presence. Close the door. In Jesus' name, your word will not return unto you. Void today, we close the door on any doubt. We close the door on any fear. We close the door. We step through.
else needs special prayer tonight?